Hey guys, Dr. Mike Kisertel here for the first inaugural lecture of RPU, Renaissance Periodization University. What the heck is that? We'll get to that in just a bit. Hopefully you know a little bit about it already. And the first course that we have for you is Introduction to Sport and Exercise Science. Kind of like a grand tour to begin your journey of knowledge. So let's take a look at what we have. As far as the contents of what we'll go through for this current lecture, we'll talk about the purpose of this uh, actual course itself that we're talking about now. We're going to talk about it in a grander scheme with the purpose of Renaissance Periodization University, or RPU as we'll call it from now on, what the purpose of that is. Then we're going to talk a bit more in depth, uh, get into the actual introduction to sport and exercise science. We're going to talk about what science is. Very good idea to define that before we define what exercise science is, then what sport science is, and then to talk about subfields within those realms and why we have them, why we can't just learn the whole thing in a straight shot, and why we have developed this entire curriculum for you. So first of all, the purpose of this course itself there's not a ton of new knowledge in this course that you're going to be able to apply directly to training clients, to training yourself, to designing diets, to understanding a whole lot of specifics. This course is to give you a starting point on that learning journey that's going to allow you to learn all of those things that you're here to learn. The course basically, this course, Introduction to Sport and Exercise Science, is designed to familiarize you with your potential path ahead so that you can do a couple of things more efficiently. First, so you can know what subjects cover what topics. If you're interested in learning some topics more than others, then you'll know which subjects cover which topics and then you can really start to zoom in your focus. Uh, a really classic example from this is that some of the nomenclature doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's kind of antiquated. One of the uh, subfields, and we call it something else here, but it's typically called athletic training. Athletic training is actually the prevention, uh, care slash management, and uh, rehabilitation of sport injuries. It doesn't have almost anything to do with actually training athletes that are healthy and not hurt. But there is athletic training majors in schools and colleges, and if you don't look into what subjects they have that cover what topics, you might sign up and try to be an athletic trainer and realize like two or three semesters in after you've already covered your basic courses that, oh, geez, this has to do with injuries entirely. It's almost nothing to do with training athletes whatsoever. So some of the nomenclature can bit off. So uh, a good thing we'll do here is talk about what subjects really cover what topics and then whatever you're interested in, you can continue to pursue through this curriculum. However, a lot of the curriculum, the whole thing actually is, is basically built in layers. And what we want is to make sure that you have the baseline knowledge to understand the second layer and the third layer and the fourth layer, because as your learning becomes more advanced, you rely heavily on the basics that you learned beforehand. So we're going to recommend to you in this course what subjects are a really good idea to learn before stepping on to more applied, more advanced other subjects. Like for example, using nothing with sport and exercise science, if you wanted to learn theoretical physics, but you didn't know any math, it would be pretty much impossible to do because theoretical physics is so based in math. So if you have a theoretical physics department at a university, the first courses they're probably going to have you take, probably required, uh, is to take really advanced math courses to make sure that you're ready to understand the theoretical physics courses, which themselves might not be any more difficult than the math courses, but just rely on the knowledge gained from that. So what we're going to be able to tell you in this introductory lecture, in this particular lecture and this whole course, which has three other lectures in it, is, okay, if you want to learn X, Y, Z, what should you learn before that in order to make sure that you're well prepared to learn what it is you want? Because, for example, if you want to learn about how athletes recover. You're going to want to learn the training principles. Before you learn that, you're probably going to want to learn some biomechanics or some, some physiology of, uh, of, of the body, of exercise and sport. Before you learn that, you probably want to learn some functional anatomy and some basic physiology. And before you learn that, you might want to learn uh, about the theory of science and how scientists look in the world so you can understand how the conclusions in the recovery literature actually reading now 
are drawn out. So super important. I'm going to repeat this over and over, be really, really uh, nitty gritty with it. That structure of making sure you learn the basics first is a really, really good idea. In addition to that, of course, we'll cover where to find the basics and where to find the applied knowledge, which courses are which. And here's the thing. Yes, almost all of the advanced courses require some basics as an underlying foundation to better learn and understand them. But as you get really high up in the categories of learning, very specific topics, they don't always require that you know every single course. For example, there is a course that's going to be offered almost exclusively about sport injuries, how they occur, why they occur, how to prevent them, how to rehabilitate people uh, and treat them for that and get them back into play. There is a lot of sport science, for example, sport nutrition, that you don't have to really know much about sport injuries to know. So when there's advanced concepts in sport nutrition that we're going to be talking about in a higher level and sport injury is at a lower level course, you don't have to go through sport injury to get to that advanced sport nutrition. So once you know what everything is, you can kind of take the best path, get the courses you need at the basic levels to go into more advanced ones. You can absolutely learn everything we have to offer and that's awesome. But if you're not quite interested or don't have the time to learn the entire curriculum, we can help you map out a track that you understand what prerequisites are required for what future courses. So all of this is for what? Well, what's the purpose of Renaissance Periodization University? What is the purpose of RPU? RPU is basically an online sport and exercise science learning program and it's based in these video lectures. Every single lecture will be delivered to you, sometimes by myself, sometimes by Dr. Hoffman, and sometimes by some of the professors and experts we have on our staff at Renaissance Periodization, and sometimes by invited guests within their expert fields. They're going to be giving these video lectures, and they're going to come with quizzes and tests for you to take. There's going to be a quiz after every single individual lecture, after every single video, and after the entire course is over, there'll be quote unquote final exam. You don't have to take these, but they're there to make sure that you are confident that you're retaining some knowledge. And these quizzes and tests are going to be pretty difficult to make sure that if you're getting really good grades on them, you could be confident that you know whatever topic you just learned very well. What is it designed to do? Well, it's designed to help you learn sport and exercise science at more than just a surface level because as many of you probably have come to RPU, you've read more than your fair share of online articles about a variety of topics. And there's a lot of stuff in online articles that people say, and you're kind of like, okay, uh, that sounds sciencey, sounds reasonable. I don't really know the background science to that, but maybe I'll take it for granted and the article might be useful. But if you want to learn at a deep level to be able to be skeptical, of, of scientific art, uh, articles or to be able to be skeptical of any online article, to be able to be skeptical of videos, to be able to design your own program, not just select the ones that you like or to select the ones you like better based on the principles, you have to learn at a very deep level. This is the kind of level that's offered at undergraduate and master's program and the baseline curriculum, the coursework that we have to offer for you, the lectures and the quizzes and the tests are at the very least equivalent to a very competitive undergraduate program as far as the quality of the professors, the quality of lectures, the depth and scope, the breadth of the material covered, and probably comparable to many master's programs as well. So it's a lot of stuff. It's basically like a, a, like a college education digitally. As far as specific and applied courses, very advanced courses like applying nutrition and recovery to tactical applications individuals, people in the military or in police and fire departments. Courses like that, of which we're going to have very many and continually updated, are almost never seen in anything short of PhD programs and even then are very unlikely. So we're going to have more courses for you in RPU, especially applied ones, than any brick and mortar PhD programs. If you go through the entire curriculum, which will be out within probably a year's time or a year and a half, and of course, there'll be more video updates after that, but the basic curriculum is going to be laid out probably within about a year or two. If you go through that entire thing and you do well in the uh, tests and quizzes and you know the material, you're going to know as much as an individual who has done a master's program or a PhD program as far as the baseline level of knowledge. That's pretty cool. 
Thing is, here's kind of the trick. We don't give a certification. There's no certification for completing the course. There's no stamp. There's no seal of approval. RPU just has one purpose. Knowledge. To bring you knowledge. If you're here to put a stamp on your personal training certificate saying that you're an RPU graduate, there's no such thing. You don't ever graduate RPU. You watched all the videos, awesome. What is your benefit to that? That you know stuff. You know a lot of stuff. You can help other people. You can help your clients. You can help yourself. It's the knowledge itself that you're here for, not a certification. Plenty of other people, plenty of other places give up certifications, and some of them are good and some of them are not great. We're not currently business of doing that. That's not the purpose of RPU. Our purpose of RPU is to bring you university-grade knowledge, something you can't get from articles and watching YouTube videos, something at a quality leap higher than that, but so it's comparable to a university setting, to university-quality education but at about one one hundredth the cost. So typical uh, rates currently, as of the filming of this video, $20 a month for RP+, Plus, which is the, the big website that contains RPU. So for $20 a month, you get to learn the equivalent amount of information that somebody who's paying twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year learning at an undergrad or master's program. You can do this at your own pace. You can do this anywhere in the world with internet connection. That's what RPU is all about, bringing you knowledge in an incredibly cheap, easy to consume, easy to consume on your own time, and delivered at a high level of quality. And mind you, this isn't simplified knowledge. These are going to be real courses. We are going to be speaking in technical terminology. Another really good reason to learn the basic courses before you get to the advanced ones. In the advanced ones, it'll be all technical. They'll make very little sense to someone who doesn't know the basics. This is a real education. This is not just a series of videos for fun. They are not tailored to individuals with no background in exercise science. The first couple are, and then after that, you have a background in exercise science, and then it gets more and more complex. It's basically, almost exactly, like a university setting. That's how we designed it. So that's the purpose of RPU. Now let's get all the way back to talking about an introduction for you to sport and exercise science. Before we can logically speak about what sport and exercise science is, we have to talk about what science is. Right? Because there's a reason it's not called sport and exercise practice, sport and exercise tradition, stuff we know about sport and exercise, sport and exercise science. Science is a systematic process of getting closer to revealing the true structure and function of the universe. Right? Science is a way by which we learn the world around us, right? And about our own structure and function as human beings, because we're parts of the universe after all. We are birthed by the universe. We live within it. We are the universe. Right? Or it sounds like a, a We Are the World it sounds like one of those records you could, uh, you know, one of those, uh, one of those really cheesy songs. So, but, but uh, all cheesiness aside, we are part of the universe and we are under the manifestation and control of all the same physical laws. So if we, when we say that science is a way for us to learn about the world, we don't just mean the outside world and you know how animals run and how Jupiter doesn't swing away from the sun. We're talking about everything down to how our own bodies and even our brains work. And the revelations of this quest for knowledge, which is science, lead to insights on how we can manipulate those structures and those functions based on our needs and desires. So we can use science to engineer outcomes. Once we know how a system works, we can tinker with it here and there to get us closer to what we want. And if you understand how a glass works and how a bottle of water works, you can pour water into the glass, making it easier to consume. You know not to pour too far. You know not to pour too little. Very simple physical system. But if we know how the human body works, as well as a glass, which is far off, but we're learning more all the time, we can manipulate the human body to become potentially more muscular, leaner, better at sports, etc. Right? Now, centuries of science have been applied so far, and the results, the result is a vast amount of knowledge about the structure and function of our world and how best to change it. Look around. What has science given us? Science is competing with other things for how to understand the world. It's competing with dogma. It's competing with tradition. It's competing with notions and other people's just random ideas. Well, I think we should do it this way, right? 
science has been competing with those things for a long time, and the d debate's kind of over. It kind of won almost everything it's been at for a while. So, for example, you know, if we still thought the Earth was flat, would we have space travel? Would we have satellites? Your GPS wouldn't work. Right? We would never be able to fly around the world. Intercontinental travel would be impossible and 50 million other different things. Right? Because we know how temperature works and we know how chemistry works, we have refrigeration. Right? Refrigerators went around before people discovered how concepts work. Once they discovered how the world works, they said, ooh, if we move this around, if we move that around, we can keep things cold and it just costs us some energy. Awesome. So all the wonderful things you see of modern society, gifts from the revelations of science. Now, that's all of science, and science obviously has subcomponents. One of those is exercise science. What is that? Very similar definition to science. Exercise science is still a systematic process of getting closer and closer to revealing the true structure and function of the human body. Not necessarily of the world, but just the human body per se. And the way that exercise science finds out about the human body is by studying changes during and after exercise training. So one of the big goals of exercise science, interestingly enough, isn't actually to study how to make exercise better, or which sets and reps are gonna grow your muscles the most, though that is one of its goals. Probably its biggest goal is to use exercise kind of like a lens, or kind of like a little poking stick. Poke at the body, see what it does, and then we can understand more about the body. So we understand how the liver produces certain enzymes. What about if we work out really hard for a couple of weeks or for a session? Or what if we have someone who works out and then they stop working out? How does the liver change? And based on how the liver changes producing those enzymes, we can learn a whole lot about how the liver works and how those enzymes are secreted. So a lot of exercise science is using exercise as a tool to learn about our bodies and not even necessarily apply that stuff to exercise, some of it, but some of it can be applied to other places, right? So in addition to that, Exercise science wants to reveal structures uh, and functions during exercise and recovery and how they change with training. So we're not just using exercise as a poking stick and saying, okay, here's a session of cardio. Let's see how your body responds. We're saying, okay, here's 12 sessions in a row. What changes about your body over time? That's the difference between an exercise session or a bout as it's called and an exercise training or chronic exercise. Training is defined technically as any more than two sessions, as any more than one session. Session number two is already exercise training. Training is the summative effect of multiple sessions. Exercise scientists are very interested in that as well, as well as what one exercise science or one, one exercise session does to the actual body. Now, of course, just like with regular science, revelations from exercise science lead us to insights on how to manipulate change various structures and functions based on our own needs and desires. For example, decades of exercise science applied, notice I said decades, not centuries, exercise science is relatively new in its modern form. We have learned a variety of things. We've learned a whole lot about how the body works in health and disease, right? When you study exercise and you can get people to have low levels of oxygen in the blood, you learn a whole lot about how low levels of oxygen in the blood uh, change various enzymes and various functions and various adaptations, you can then apply a lot of that literature to people who have low blood oxygen for other reasons, maybe because of disease, right? We use that knowledge to make the body healthier or prevent or treat disease as best as we can, which is awesome. There's been a ton of insight from exercise science that has helped people become healthier. For example, research on biomechanics is often making different kinds of uh, padding, different specialized soles for feet. Some people have uh, legs that are slightly different length or they have some kind of foot abnormality. Learning about biomechanics and how the forces operate at the foot, we can design a better foot uh, or better sole for your shoes that makes maybe your hip hurt less or overall you're walking more relaxing and less strenuous to the body. In addition to that, and this is the part that we're more interested in learning about at RPU and probably teaching you about as well, is exercise science teaches a lot about how the body works during exercise training and recovery, and thus we take that and enhance the body's ability to get the most out of exercise, the most health and the most fitness out of exercise and training. And a lot of individuals who study exercise science are really interested in that last part. 
Okay, now that we know about how the body works, great medical stuff, super cool, right? This is not a medicine university. We're going to take exercise science and figure out how to get the most fitness and the most health, right, from exercise and training. But if we want performance and if we want really radical changes in appearance, we'll have to look somewhere else. And that's to sports science. We're going to flip the slide over to sports science. Exercise science is a little bit different than sports science. Exercise science uses exercise to study the body so it can more know more about the body in general, kind of what we were just like talking about, um, and potentially use this knowledge uh, to enhance uh, medicine or just more basic science work. Okay, we've used exercise to really figure out how the mitochondria in the cell work. Now that we know how the mitochondria and the cell work better, we can take that knowledge and use it to test the mitochondria in more ingenious ways to learn even more about how the cell works, just more basic science. In addition to that, of course, medicine, uh, treating diseases, etc. And exercise science deals a lot with health, how to recommend more efficient and health-promoting exercise, diet and lifestyle behaviors are all questions exercise science can answer. But Sport science is coming from a little bit of a different perspective. Sport science uses the revelations of exercise science, it learns a lot from exercise science, and its own direct sport science specific research to enhance the performance of athletes at sport. Right? Huge, huge difference. Sport scientists are always asking the question of how can we make athletes better? And to be completely honest, Answers or facts or revelations that don't have much to say about making athletes better don't interest sports scientists sometimes at all or sometimes that much. So when someone says, hey, we got a way to be healthier, eh, sports scientists are mildly interested in that. What about how to win more games? What about how to jump higher, run faster, be more muscular? Now, that's stuff that sports scientists are more interested in. Now, of course, you don't have to use sports science or its lessons to just get better at sport. You might not play a sport. You might just want to be leaner and more muscular and stronger even though you don't compete. Well, those are all subcomponents of sport science and sport science has a lot to say about them. So it could also be used to enhance those subcomponents like body composition, strength, etc. So you can use sport science to learn about that. Whereas exercise science might not have much to say about that subject by itself, right? Sport science, the difference between sport and exercise science, the biggest one is that sport science is much more goal focused because exercise science helps with general medical stuff, it helps with exercise performance, it helps with basic science. Sports science doesn't have a whole lot to do with medicine. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with basic science. Sports science is very goal focused, it's more applied, and nearly everything in its realm leads to answering the question of how do I or we as a team get better at our sports or better at our goals, which are sport related, like getting more muscular, getting less fat, et cetera, et cetera. So sports science is a lot of what we're going to be learning in this course, and we're going to be learning a ton of exercise science too, but it's important to note the distinction that when we talk about recovery for sport, for example, we're talking about what kind of recovery is going to get us to win more. The health stuff is maybe not a huge interest. On the other hand, when we talk in a later course about the psychology behind adhering to a certain fitness plan, adherence is our number one. Getting people into the gym, getting people to eat healthy, getting people to live lower stress lives chronically. And you say, well, how is that going to enhance their performance? Well, we don't care about that at the time because that's exercise science. We care about health. We care about longevity. We care about wellness as opposed to sport. We care about winning. Now, sport and exercise science is an enormous field. And all of the knowledge within that field is incredibly vast. It is so vast that no one expert knows even a very large, meaningful fraction of it. For example, I myself am considered by many to be an expert in sport and exercise science. There's a whole ton of stuff I know so little about, it's almost embarrassing. Here's one, injury. I will not be giving the sport injury course at RPU. I am not remotely qualified to do it. I have a couple of answers for people who are hurt. Uh, don't do whatever hurts and go see a specialist. That's all I know about the stuff. There's biomechanics individuals that run graphs and equations and numbers and calculations on exactly the joints and forces and angles during walking gait or during running. I know almost nothing about that kind of stuff. And I'm an expert, right? I really am an expert. 
But the, the science is so vast, we know so much, and there's so much to know that we can't just all learn sport and exercise science. Because if you tried to learn all of sport and exercise science, you would come away with not knowing a whole lot of anything, you'd just be nitpicking at various little parts. The whole field is enormous, it's not something you can learn in one course. You can learn a lot of it over the breadth of multiple courses, which is where subfields come in. Right? So another issue is that a lot of aspects of sport and exercise science require an enormous amount of baseline information to even understand the field, let alone do research in it or work in it or something like that. For example, take a look at Toyota Motor Company, for example. Toyota. What do they do? They make cars and some other stuff. Let's just say they make cars. Does anyone at that company know how to run everything in the company? That's nonsense. So let's take a look at the vehicle engineers, the individuals that actually design cars. They know that stuff front to back. They are a subfield within Toyota, a subspecialty. But if you try to get the people that engineer cars to work on the legal team and talk with lawyers about how their current car looks a little bit too much like Honda's and there might be a lawsuit, they have no earthly idea how to do legal work. They have a legal team for that, and they're incredible specialists. They know some general stuff about Toyota, just like everyone else does who works there, but they know the law really well. Now, if you get a legal team expert to try to build you a car, it'll be the biggest disaster you've ever seen in your life. They may know just in rudimentary terms how cars work, and that's about it. Maybe they know a little bit about some component they studied for a while to try to defend the case that it was an original component, but they sure as heck don't know how to build cars in general or even create anything in specific. They're like, hey, build me a car. You turn on this welding robot. They're like, I, I don't know how to turn it on. Like, exactly, you've never done this before. So just like building cars in that industry has a ton of requisite knowledge. When you have to go to law school for a long time to be a good lawyer, you have to go to an engineering program to build cars. Those are usually mutually exclusive. Almost nobody has the combined knowledge of that. You could say, okay, well, what about Toyota CEO? What about somebody at a university? The analogy is somebody at a university that runs a sport and exercise science department, the department chair, something like for RPU that uh, Dr. James Hoffman and I are doing. Don't they know everything? Well, no. Sometimes they have their specialty areas, but they usually just know how to run the whole thing, which is very different than running all of its subcomponent parts, right? So at the end of the day, you can't just learn everything all at once because there's so much to learn as a baseline level to be able to apply it, right? So we got some constraints. It's a ton of information, and you have to know the basics before you know the advanced, and there are a lot of questions that are so far away from each other, even though they're in the same field, it would take you months or years of study to be able to know either one of them well with very little in common. For example, basic questions. How do cells work? Well, somebody could give you a pretty good answer on that. There are cell biologists at universities that study exactly how cells work. Try asking them how much creatine you should take to enhance your performance. They're going to have no idea. They say, oh, creatine, creatine, yeah. Uh, I can tell you exactly how creatine works in the muscles and exactly how it helps your cells produce energy a little bit faster. Um, as far as how much to take, no clue. They've never seen that literature because it's so applied and their stuff is so general. So we can't possibly teach you how a cell works and how much creatine to take in the same course because one is super general, one's applied. It's a totally different curriculum. It's a totally different discussion. Good news. This complexity is possible to organize logically by putting it into subfields, right? So subfields are sections of sport and exercise science which focus on specific things. The first focus is that they are uh, sorted by relatedness, right? So the subfield of athletic training or care and prevention of injuries has everything to do with injuries in one field. If it's about injuries, it's in here. If it's not, it's not in here, right? So these sub subfields, these subtopics that compose exercise and sports science, they're uh, organized by relatedness. How related are the topics to each other? That's how you get a lot of these names. Sport nutrition, care and prevention of injuries, sport psychology, everything psychological to do with sport in one field. And 
So kind of on the horizontal, they're organized by relatedness, and on the vertical, kind of in the sprawling tree pattern of our curriculum, they can be split by applicability, right? Basic versus applied subfields. So the basics, for a while, everyone has to know, and there are some basics that only some people have to know, but the applied stuff is super interesting, super relevant, but you got to get through the basics first to know the applied stuff. After you do that, you can get into the basics much more than you have to to learn the applied stuff, but it's two different focus areas. So we have courses that are very basic. For example, physiology of exercise. I mean, geez, all of physiology. That means sport nutrition's in there. That means injury mechanisms are in there. That means adaptation to sport is in there. That's a very basic understanding of all the mechanisms that doesn't go into specifics at all. And then once you know physiology, you can take another course in another subfield of sport nutrition. Do you have to know a good basic amount of, of sport physiology, exercise physiology, to know sport nutrition? Yes, right? But do you have to know sport nutrition to know exercise and sport physiology? No, absolutely not, right? So by splitting things up in their relatedness, and in how basic versus applied they are, we get this very, very neat logical structure that you can work your way through depending on what you want to know. So in order to help you with this logical structure, we've developed a uh, subfield classification system at RPU. It is six levels, levels one, two, three, four, five, and six. In each level is a different kind of learning. So we're going to go through them really quick. I'm going to just summarize them, and then we're actually going to have, uh, in the next couple of courses, more in-depth about what each level means, right? The levels go from more general to more specific, right, just like we talked about, and from more basic research or more basic understandings to more application kind of stuff. So the higher levels are more specific, and the higher levels are more applied. Level one it only has one course in it. And it is the introduction to sport and exercise science. Is this course you're taking right now? Awesome. You have to have level one to familiarize yourself with the field of which you're talking about, unless you've had this kind of course somewhere else at a university. You just want to brush up on your stuff. Then it's totally cool. But this is the first step right here. This is the only course in level one. Before you go on to anything else, you have to have an understanding of where it's all going. That's what this course is for. Level two are what we call the foundational prerequisites. Level two has a couple of courses on just basically understanding science, understanding very basic anatomy, understanding very basic physiology, that once we start teaching you something like exercise and sport physiology, you already know how basic systems work. Now you just have to learn and apply them to sport instead of learning all of physiology at the same time as you learn how it's applied to sport. That's a really, really big task. So foundational prerequisites are level two, highly, highly recommended for anyone that wants to learn beyond those levels. In level three, we have what are known as the major basic subfields. Uh, now you start to hear terms you've perhaps heard for the first time, uh, you know, uh, sport physiology, uh, biomechanics, how the body moves as a machine, et cetera, et cetera. Those are now real sport and exercise science curriculum once you've been prepped by levels one and two for learning them. In level four, we have the first major applied subfields. Those are the fields for the first time in which you can actually really use stuff to help you with your own sport training, with other people's sport training, with your own exercise, with your own fitness, with your own health, and with helping other people. That's the first time you get really any application. Up through level three, it's all basics to establish a deep connection of knowledge that will let you learn all the other applied stuff and apply it 50 times better. Level five gets to be much more specific applied subfields, stuff that at this point you might branch out to one thing or another and probably not have to learn every single basis. And level six really is the level that's going to grow the most. It's kind of like the fruit at the end of all the branches of the tree and after the leaves. It is full of recommendations, guides, current best practices, seminars, and that's when you know all the basics already and you've taken your particular path through the more applied stuff. Now you can learn very, very in-depth, very go-to, here's what you do, here's how to build programs, here's how to monitor athletes, all the very specific advice that you may be very keen on learning, but you have to have all that background before you can do that. Level six is a lot of times the level for which articles are written 
And a lot of times some uh, you know popular books are written at level six. The problem is level six at RPU is gonna be very, very based in technical knowledge usually. We're going to assume you already know all the stuff in levels, uh, all the pertinent stuff anyway, in levels one through five. So it's gonna be very, very advanced, but as well, very, very applied, right? So next time for lecture number two for this course for Introduction to Sport and Exercise Science, we're gonna talk about the foundations and basic subfields, what they are, why it's a good idea to learn them, and what you can expect. Thanks for tuning in. See you in lecture two.